Hello everyone, welcome to the next lecture for ME2761. Uh, today we're going to be talking about computer-aided manufacturing. I changed the order up a little bit here. I'll cover CAM today. Uh, I feel like covering it today. So, uh, gd and we'll talk about later on. A couple updates on schedule. I sent an announcement on, on Canvas. If you haven't read that, please do. Uh, get your memo three done by Friday, uh, so you should be working with your team on that. I'll leave it up to you what tools you use. You can use Canvas. Uh, you can create a Slack group, but whatever you need on that, uh, work together and get get your memo three done. If you need anything on that, let me know. Uh, presentations will be due then too. A uh, couple updates on that. Uh, so again, the memo and presentation are due Friday on Canvas. Uh, if you have trouble accessing CAD. Uh, which is addressed in the announcement I made on Canvas, uh, do detailed hand sketches instead. Uh, so keep the level of, if you do sketches, they need to be better quality than the sketches for the previous memo. Um, that's just that there's no way to guarantee access for CAD for everybody in this class because everyone's spread out all over the place with different kinds of access to the internet and different computers and uh, I tried to go down that rabbit hole and it didn't end very well. So uh, I'm not going to require physically or actually doing anything on CAD for the remainder of the semester just because I can't guarantee you all have have equal access to it so again if you, if you don't have CAD sketches you can do detailed hand sketches if you have access to some other CAD program that's perfectly fine you know if you want to use SketchUp or something like that that's perfectly fine uh, or you can do do hand sketches for memo 3 uh, presentations will be done via zoom meetings I don't want to do any kind of big town hall zoom meeting uh, for this so what I'll do instead is schedule each team to present uh, to me via a Zoom meeting. Uh, it'll be more of a design, actual, like a proper industry type design review than, than a presentation format. So I probably won't have you all go through uh, and, and do a regular five minute spiel like you've been. I'll, I'll go through each person or each team and just uh, go through the slides and, and talk a little more in depth about the, de the design. So uh, it'll be a little more in, in depth than what we've been doing in, in class. So something we might actually be able to do better in this format than, than doing it in class. Uh, project. So I can't do a build. There's just, there's no way because I, I have no idea what access to equipment you all have. And you, you know, you're not even supposed to be working together with each other in person. So it's a mess. There's literally no way I can do a build. So uh, that sucks. I, I literally know no way to get around around this though I can't make everyone make a prototype I, there's just no way we can do a physical test so that's got to be some kind of a paper project and I, that is terrible I know I hate it too uh, I'm the advisor for the formula electric team and their car that they've been working on all year and spent a $2,500 entry fee for is a paper project now so um, just you know add that to the list of things that are crappy about this so uh, we'll do a paper project there'll be a new memo memo four I'll assign that once we're done with memo three and there'll be a final round of presentations that we'll do in the zoom design review format so uh, keep an eye out for those over the next week or so uh, and those we do towards the end of class NX quizzes and finals uh, so I've gone back and forth on what to do on these so uh, here's my current thought on it uh, what I'll probably stick with is to replace NX quiz 3 and 4 with conceptual questions uh, so for like FEA uh, I can have some conceptual questions that we talked about in the slides for FEA along with maybe a couple things specifically about NX that are covered in the tutorial uh, we'll do that for quiz 3 and quiz 4 and we'll do that for the final exam as well and honestly the more I thought about that the, the less I think that's a terrible idea so uh, I think that that's going to be the, the best thing we can do with, with software for now so uh, if there's some big change in availability of NX, I, I will let you all know. But uh, again, at this point, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with this. So uh, that's a update on schedule and any changes. If you have any questions, just shoot me an email. Uh, if there's enough demand, I can set up sort of virtual office hours too. I haven't got a lot of contact from people. So, uh, but if, if I need uh, if if I need to set up a time for that, that's something I can I can absolutely do during my regularly scheduled office hours, previously scheduled office hours. Okay, so today I want to talk about computer-aided manufacturing. Uh, a lot of topics to cover here. Uh, so there'll be some videos that I can't show for copyright reasons, but I will put, make sure I link those all in the description in the down below. So uh, you'll be able to click these links. Uh, so I just recommend when we get to a video like that, just pause it and watch the video. Uh, so again, I, I really wish I could show them, but I, I can't. Uh, so CAM basics. 
so you need geometry. So that's that's the starting point. Is you need some kind of geometry to to machine. So uh, you know if you're doing hand manual machining, you're limited in what what you can do with the equipment you have. I mean things like straight lines are easy, but you know machining something like this by hand, it it's doable. People did it for a long time before computer controlled machining existed. As a a lot of machining stuff by hand with a die grinder or or you know a lot of tips and tricks and that uh, you know, expert machinists learned to sort of make make things like this and and the way drawings were made the way things were called out was completely different you know nowadays if i wanted to make something complicated like that i make a cad model uh and then i throw it into a software that makes tool paths that will guide a cutter or some other process to to machine the part and uh it's gotten or a lot easier nowadays to make parts like this, which means that as designers, we have a lot more flexibility in, in what we, we can design the geometry wise. Uh, basic process, you create your geometry, you bring it into your CAM program. So some uh, CAD software will have this built in. So this is uh, we have solid CAM that you can get as an add-on to SolidWorks. Uh, so you can go back and forth between your modeling and CAM environment. NX has CAM built in as well. It's got a machining module that's actually very, very capable. Uh, I mean, it's 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 serious CAM. Uh, I mean, it's on the order of of uh, you know really high end CAM packages. They're standalone packages. Uh, so NX, that's what I do most of my CAM in nowadays. Um, set up your machining environment. So pick your tool, pick uh, diameters, tool lengths, uh, feed rate, speeds, things like that. Set up your machine. How many axes it has. Uh, you can actually make solid models of the entire machine so you can check clearances virtually. Uh, pick your tools, uh, then generate tool paths. Uh, so you basically set up what kind of operation you want to do, pick the boundaries for it, the surfaces that are going to be machined, uh, parameters for like step over and depth of cut. And it, uh, the CAM software goes through and generates these tool paths that you can see here, here in Scient. Uh, the algorithm for that is uh, pretty sophisticated. That would be something that I would consider a hard problem. Is you know, given arbitrary geometry, uh, you know, calculate the best point to move, the control point to move a tool over to uh, machine down to that geometry. That that's a hard problem that's been solved for you. So uh, your CAM software will, will do that do that for you. Uh, verify tool paths. Uh, that can be in like this, like where you simulate the tool path. You can actually simulate material removal from stock down to the finished part. Uh, but Verify that the tool paths do what you want them to do, uh, and then you end up by exporting G-code. So G-code is the actual code that's going to go into most machines. Almost every CNC machine seems to be controlled by G-code. Uh, there's some specialty machines out there that aren't, but your generic CNC machines are going to be run by G-code. Uh, so normally, or like in the old days, back when G-code was invented and done on punch cards, this was stuff that was done by hand. Uh, and it was basically a programming language for running running these machines automatically. Nowadays, you really just need to glance over the G-code and make sure things look somewhat right, uh, and then run it into the machine and verify it in the machine. So uh, nowadays, for most complicated parts, you really don't even dig that much into the G-code. Most of the work's done in the CAM environment and then validating things on the machine. Uh, it still pays to know a little bit about G-code, though, if you're doing this. Uh, lots of uh, standalone software like MasterCam and SurfCam, it's a bunch of other big big name ones, especially for multi-axis machining. Uh, these can get very expensive and very complicated very quickly for multi-axis machining. Uh, and it's built into some programs too. So G-Code, uh, it's programming language for controlling numerically controlled machines. Uh, it's old, we're talking 50s here. Uh, and so you can imagine a programming language developed in the 50s has some oddities. Uh, compared to like a modern programming language, something like Python. Uh, it's pretty crude, uh, but it works. It still works, and we're stuck with it for the foreseeable future. Uh, it started out with punch cards, and now these are text files. So these are editable text files with various file extensions. But there's no standard extension, which is frustrating, but they're, they're text files, so you can open them up with, with Notepad or any other text editor, Notepad++. Plus Plus. Uh, so there's G codes and M codes. Uh, G code is an action usually. M code sets the machine up in some in some different way. Uh, so things like a G00 is the machine moves from one spot to another spot in a straight line quickly. G01 is it moves from one spot to another in a straight line at some specified feed rate. 
uh, using the, the F symbol, you can see like here's a G01 with an F. Uh, that 75 sets the feed rate on whatever units the machine set up and so it could be uh, inches per minute or millimeters per minute I guess I don't know I can't remember metric I'm not I don't know a lot of machining in metric so I don't, don't know the numbers I believe they are millimeters per minute though because uh, there seem to be numbers in the thousands on on 3d printing by the way 3d printing uses G code too. almost all the 3d printers I've ever seen including most of the homebrew ones all, all run on G-code. So the, the slicing software generates G-code that, that actually gets loaded into the printer as well. It's all pretty well all metric in, in 3D printing land, whereas most of the manufacturing equipment seems to be, it's a mix because you can run machines in either unit system, but I see mostly that in inches. Uh, you can do circular arcs. That, honestly, that this is the biggest limiting factor of G-code is you can go in a straight line and you can go in a circular arc, and that's pretty much it as far as core functionality. So things like spline, stuff like that, uh, complex curves, it all has to be broken down into straight lines and circular arcs. But, you know, at some point we need some tolerance of a thousandth of an inch, a half a thousand, ten thousand, something like that. So you can guarantee you're going to get, you, so if you take like a curve and you start breaking it into line segments, right, you can guarantee your accuracy at a certain point or you can set a certain bound for how how much tolerance between the straight line and the curve and then increase the number of line segments until you get that tolerance and and make it work or even better would be to fit a circular arc to each of these points and then your your tolerance goes goes down with fewer fewer steps so uh, even though it's limited to straight lines and circular arcs you can still do anything complicated with it by breaking it down into a bunch of simple elements it's like you know you can you know, this this set of slides is is a digital file on a computer. It's all zeros and ones at some point. So uh, we can just break something complicated down to a bunch of simple operations, and it actually works, which is one of the reasons why it's stuck around so long. Uh, machine controls. You can make the spindle go clockwise, counterclockwise, tool change, uh, had coolant, things like that. There's some that are controller and machine specific. There's some that are pretty generic. Uh, the end result is each machine is going to have its own little format for G-code that it likes, and you have to make what's called a post processor to interpret the uh, the commands that your CAM software wants to make to what your machine wants to, to take in. You need some kind of a translator. And that's the post processor and different different post processor you'll basically have to make one for each machine or pay somebody to make one for your machine i've made a few of these for different mills and lights it's very frustrating that this hasn't been standardized uh, but there's always a few little things you have to tweak when you set up a new machine and set a post processor for it so nx for example has got some some generic ones built in uh, some of them work great for three axis milling but if you wanted to do anything fancier than that it gets a lot more complicated uh, G-code variables, uh, so there's different axes, A, B, C, X, Y, Z are pretty common. X, Y, Z would be your most common. Uh, X and Z for a lathe, X, Y, and Z for a mill, and then start adding on additional axes, you get A, B, and C up to six. Uh, then you can see immediately when we hit six axes, then, then you know, if I have a seven axis machine, what do I do? And again, it's a lot more complicated at that point. Uh, feed rate, inches per minute, millimeters per minute, inches per revolution, or millimeters per revolution, depending on how your machine's set. Your machine might be set up in an uh, absolute feed rate or in a uh, spindle relative. Or For a lathe, you especially, you do a lot of inch per revolution or millimeter per revolution feed rate on a, on a lathe. So your surface speed is constant. So uh, that depends on, a, a, there's a modal G-code that's you set it in the machine and that, that, that state persists. Uh, that you have to set to determine which of the units which units it takes uh, these numbers are usually very different you know this might be 12 this might be point like zero one or something uh, so you can get several orders of magnitude off here and if your modal is wrong and it does interprets an inch per minute as an inch per revolution bad bad things can happen so there's a lot of little places where where you can cause all sorts of bad problems uh, by mixing codes up uh, tool diameter and length offset, it's not used a lot in the cam era. Uh, you know, when you're doing stuff by hand, you might use offsets, but uh, when you're using using cam, it usually takes care of the offsets for you. Uh, arc center point when you're doing circular interpolate, interpolation, O is the program name, S is for spindle speed, T is for tool selection, and so on. Uh, some of the G codes, G00 is rapid, moves as fast as it, it can. Uh, that can be scary fast on some big machines. Uh, you don't want to get in the middle of it or have a tool in somewhere where it can get, get hit. Uh, G01, linear interpolation, straight lines. G02 and 3, uh, arcs. G04 is a dwell. 
setting your inches obviously if you have that wrong that can cause all sorts of problems because these are going to be off by a factor of 25.4 g28 is usually some kind of a home cycle uh, and that's for zeroing out the uh, origins of the servos or steppers uh, threading operations radius compensation for cutter comp the wear compensation and tool radius compensation uh, spindle speeds absolute versus incremental so if you're going to reference your XYZ coordinates from an absolute origin you use that if you're going to reference each operation from the previous operation you use you use that M codes uh, M00 is a stop M01 is an optional stop there will be some kind of a button that you can or a trigger that you can say whether it stops on those or not uh, M02 ends the program M03 clockwise M04 counterclockwise on the spindle uh, for a mill or a lathe. Uh, M05 would be a stop, M06 is a tool change, different kinds of coolant, flood, M08 is the most common, a flood coolant, turn the coolant off. And again, the, a lot of these M codes start to be machine specific. These are pretty generic here, but they get machine specific very quickly. So, uh, workflow for milling, uh, geometry, use your CAM software to make tool paths, verify them in the software, create G code, put the G code in the machine, uh, that can be done a lot of different ways. In the old days, you would either drip feed it in over a serial port, like an old school 9-pin or 25-pin serial port, uh, which is as painful as it sounds, uh, or you'd load it in on a memory card, like a PCMCIA flash card, which, thank God, those don't exist very much anymore because they were terrible. Uh, nowadays, you can bring it in on a regular SD card or pump something in through a USB serial port. There's still some machines that you hook up an old 9-pin serial port to and, and drip G-code into it as, as necessary. Uh, that's how a lot of the 3D printers seem to work, is they, they, uh, they drip feed uh, code in. Uh, some of them take it all into memory and then run from there. Some of them you drip the code in, like one, one line at a time over a serial port. Uh, test the code on the machine and then make a test part, do a dry cut where you're not cutting material and verify that things work the way they're supposed to. Uh, and then put a part in there and actually make it. Uh, for a lathe, it's a pretty similar similar process. Uh, the main difference in you know basic mills three axes, a basic lathe's two axes. So you've got the z axis this way and the x axis for your tool this way, but the process is the same. It's best to start with CNC milling in my experience. That's something you can get your head head around. And if you screw up, you usually you know move somewhere you weren't supposed to move and break your tool off or damage your part or kick your part out of the chuck. Uh, you can break a machine, but it's, it's somewhat hard to do in a mill. It's still doable. Uh, turning is scary when you get started. If you rapid the tool into the chuck, bad bad things happen. I've, I haven't been around while that happened, but uh, one of Randall Lewis's uh, lathes had somebody do that and blew the chuck up and threw the jaws almost through the metal housing on it. And if it, the metal housing hadn't been there, it would have been very dangerous. So uh, these machines, especially turning, can get very dangerous very quickly, especially when you get to high, high spindle power. So uh, demo video down here. Again, I'll, I'll post a link to that in the description. Uh, mill turn centers, when you start getting into your complicated multi-axis mill turn centers, so you start needing specialized CAM software uh, to make tool paths just because it's, it's hard trying to take a part geometry and break it into you know, five, six, seven, eight different axes of, of motion. So uh, there's again the video link in the description for a mill turn. So you know, very complicated geometry like machining an engine block or a cylinder head, something like that with a multi-axis machine. It gets really complicated really quickly. CNC plasma cutting, uh, pretty simple. It's usually a two-axis process. Uh, you usually just need 2D geometry, uh, like a, a DXF file or a DWG file, something like that. Uh, you could take that, and uh, the CAM is really simple for it because it's basically all, all just profiling. Uh, so the CAM is either done in the software that came with a plasma cutter or it's really, really, really trivial CAM. Uh, Good for cutting sheet metal, you know, anywhere from, you know, relatively thin sheets up to maybe an inch or so with plasma cutting. It's a relatively cheap process, too, uh, compared to CNC turning or milling. CNC plasma cutters are, are reasonably cheap. Uh, robotic arms gets pretty complicated just because your axes aren't always orthogonal and your axes are actually rotating. So you all in dynamics know all about rotating coordinate systems. These are rotating coordinate system nightmares. Uh, so CAM's a challenge for these. That's a big research area is coming up with really good path planning and motion planning for, for these arms. Those of you on Mars rover know what I'm talking about here. A uh, big gantry mill works just like a smaller mill. It's just, just bigger and more expensive. 
uh, for big mold making, uh, for composite layups or uh, stamping dies, uh, you need a big machine. So, but it works just like the smaller machines. Uh, for 3D printing, uh, this is some proprietary software, although nowadays there's some really good open source options out there uh, for doing this. Uh, this is something that, you know, you can buy a, a decent usable 3D printer for about 200 bucks and uh, get free slicing software and be 3D printing at home. So if you're really bored and you've got 200 bucks and you want to spend on something, uh, we use Ender 3s and we're making a bunch of masks and shields for, for Phelps Health right now as part of this whole coronavirus deal. And uh, we've got an army of Ender 3s and you can get those things locally in stores and they're a couple hundred bucks. And honestly, it works surprisingly well for a $200 printer. So with that $200 printer and a little bit of PLA or other plastic and free software, you can be making plastic widgets at home. So if you're bored and want to take up 3D printing, now's a good time to do it if you can find printers, that is. But anyway, uh, the file format for 3D printing is almost always it's STL, is the, the representation of the geometry, which is a faceted file. Uh, it's not a great format for this, but it's what people have settled on, so, and it's easy to slice. So you see a lot of STL files being swapped around. Uh, pretty well always in metric for this. Uh, again, the cam is usually pretty easy. There's some, some tricks of the trade for uh, offset, layer height, things like that, that honestly, I was doing this stuff 15 years ago and forgotten everything. So uh, I'm not that versed in it nowadays. I've kind of had to be in the last week, get better at it. But, uh, but there's a lot of little tricks of the trade, but you know, it's 2020, you guys can look on the internet and find tutorials for, for doing the cam for this. Or if you're just curious, you can get the free software, like uh, Slicer with a three instead of an E is one. Uh, there's a few other ones I can't remember the names on, but uh, they're free open source uh, slicing programs and you can just play around with slicing geometry even if you don't have a machine. It's, it's something pretty easy to do nowadays. Uh, conversational controllers, you can hook up uh, cam controllers to existing manual machines and make them CNC machined. Uh, you need to add servo motors to the axes. So here you've got an X and Y axis and a Z axis on the quill uh, and then you put a controller on it. Uh, and in these you can walk up with a drawing and punch in basically the geometry and it will generate some crude tool paths for you We've got one of these in our student machine shop works pretty nice if you don't want to spend the time to go full full CNC on something uh, DIY is a huge thing nowadays and why is mainly because of these little guys uh, steppers are a very cheap way of getting precision motion control you need a stepper you need a step driver and you need some kind of an interface board and all these things are, are really cheap nowadays um, I mean steppers 10 20 bucks for a stepper for like a 3d printer maybe even cheaper uh, the drivers are really cheap the interface is all done through like parallel port or something like that it's really really cheap and simple as long as you've got a computer with a parallel port uh, I've messed around with some of this stuff, and it's amazing what you can do with, with very little money. I mean, for a few hundred bucks, you can buy all of this stuff, a power supply, some steppers, some step boards, and a step and a, and an interface, and some cables, and basically make any little machine CNC. So everything from 3D printing, CNC hot wire, little CNC mill, CNC routers, things like that, anything that you need to make motion control nowadays, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, there's some software for running these things that's free. Uh, Linux CNC is the one I'm most familiar with, which is a Linux distribution that uses a parallel port to run all the steppers, and uh, uses, we use it for a plasma cutter and a couple other things in the makerspace. And real simple, little easy package, you, know, you just basically put the CD in, in your PC and boot it and, it, and it runs. You can run right off the CD or you can actually install it natively. Uh, and just with some, a few parts you can easily source, you can make anything CNC nowadays. It doesn't mean it's good, it works, it doesn't mean it's good, though we talked about open loop versus closed loop control in a previous lecture, and you know, these are inherently open loop and can lose steps. Uh, servos are better, but servos are a lot. I mean, one decent servo is going to cost as much as all of this stuff that's circled here, at least. So, uh, it's a little bit about CAM and CNC machining, and I'll post links to all of these videos in the description on YouTube. Uh, so that's it for today. I'll be communicating with you all through some Canvas announcements later on this week. Uh, thank you. That's it.